What is a bit sad today is that in the desire to be hip or cool and to present a message and a picture of the church that would be inviting and acceptable, many times the presentation goes uh, of the cross and the gospel, the true message of the gospel is going out the window or left a bit in the, in the dark. I was listening to a song of a Christian uh, writer this week that is also a pastor. It's a very wonderful song. It's a positive song. And many of us need to hear these nice songs. There's no sex in it. There's no killing. There's no murder. It's a very positive sex, uh, a song. But uh, what, what it says, it says, it says, the message is, what I wish you is happiness. A corner of paradise on earth. Lots of love and tenderness. The, are, these are my dearest wishes, hope, and riches. So that's the old message of the song. There's no cross, there's no Jesus, there's no like whatever redemptions or whatever, but my dearest wishes for you is that you will have a corner of paradise here on earth, and that you will have hope and riches, and that you will just be happy and cool. So that is a wonderful song. Actually, I like it very much, and I, I'm not criticizing the song. What I'm saying is that if this becomes the nature of our presentation of what the church should be like, you come here, we will not trouble you with anything, you know, like uh, you're a sinner, uh, you must repent, uh, you know, look at sin or whatever. We will just tell you what God can do in your life, improve your life, and make you feel good about yourself, you know, which is part of the gospel. But if, if the cross is not the means by which we attain that transformation and that we can go to heaven, we have heard so many bad news this, this week of what is happening, how much it shows us of the urgency to reach out to all the nations with a message that will make sure that these people are all going to heaven. This is about, the, about, about this. I was also reading about this, this church who are using, this is a, an article written about a church. And uh, the people says, oh, they are so modern, they are young, energetic, and modern in their communication. They're on internet, Facebook, and they, have, they, put, fl they put flyers on, on, on the, the cars and everything. And it says, uh, under flyers, you will see no cross and no stern images. That, that is the, their trademark. They will not bother you with the cross or with picture of Jesus dying on the cross or whatever. They just want you to go to this church. The church is meeting in a resto bar for a happy celebration. So everything is happy, everything is about celebration, but we will not bother you with the cross or with something that relates you to, to the song, to the cross. So I just want to, to say that in the coming years to come, this approach to religion, to church, to the gospel is going to increase and become more and more and more. So I have a call for you and for the parents in this church that since this is the direction that the religious world is going, how much you need to be very attentive to the faith, how do you transmit your faith to your children so that they will not just follow whatever is popular, whatever the youth group is the bigger, whatever the music is the best in town or whatever, but that your children will understand the, funda the fundamental of the Christian message, the message of Jesus Christ. When, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, there was one thing that was important. He didn't go about everything that is nice and how you can feel good and all of this. You must be born again. And that's, that's, that's what the message is all about. You must be born again. And Jesus starts with truly, truly. And these words are amen, amen. As if you look in the Bible, it's amen, amen. This must be like that. It's very important. I'm stressing this truth. Amen, amen. You must be born again. And then Nicodemus interprets everything literally. He looks at the physical impossibility of a man entering his mother. And that shows the natural inability of 
human mind to understand the things of God. And why is it like this? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, it explained it. The mind of man has been darkened because of sin. Sin has brought a, a, a dark veil, a, a corruption, an inability to understand the mysteries of God because it's holiness, it's pure, it's just, it's perfect. So the mind of man has been darkened by sin. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God due to the hardening of their hearts. And until this is dealt with, there is no understanding of the things of God. So no wonder why Jesus go straight into the heart of the matter. You are a teacher in Israel. You know the Old Testament law. You are an educated man. But unless you are born again, it will be impossible for you to understand anything of the, of the, the Word of God because the mind is darkened. And that's when the water comes in. Why you need to be washed and water to be born of water in the spirit because water represents the washing of our sins so if this if the mind the heart the understanding the uh, the the, the, uh, the um, yeah the understanding of ma man has been darkened because of sin and it brings it impossible, then it needs to be washed. You know, if you have a dirty window, many of you know how to wash windows here in this place. So if you have dirty glasses, dirty windows, or if you uh, drive a car and a storm, and there's a lot of mud and it splashes in the windshield, you will see nothing. You need, before you see the road or what, where you see and enjoy the view, you need to wash. And the brain is in the same way. Until you will wash what has been darkened by sin, you will never be able to understand the purity of God and the heavenly truths of God because they are darkened by the flesh, by the sin and everything. And then the Holy Spirit will play his role in this and it will give you revelation, conviction. Uh, you know, the light will come in and then you can continue. Then Jesus continue on with another uh, uh, Illustration from nature to help him understand another aspect. It's the natural, the natural birth. Why is it so important, the natural birth? Because from the natural birth, you inherit the nature of a human being, the nature of your parents. And born of the flesh is flesh, means that the children born of parents in this world are of the same nature as their parents. They are born uh, in a sinful nature and they are unfit and unable to enter God's kingdom. What is born of flesh is flesh. It remains flesh. You cannot take what is born in flesh and makes it fit for the uh, heavenly truths and the heavenly reality or everything. And you can imagine at this point how uh, Nicodemus was shocked or surprised because Jesus says, you must not be surprised. Because Nicodemus is hearing something for the first time in his life. This is a new truth. You know, for us, we look at this text like we are so familiar with it, it looks like old stuff. But for Nicodemus, it's brand new revelation and understanding that never been explained before. This kind of talk has never taken place. This is the very first time in human history that this theme is being developed. Nicodemus was a Jewish person. He was born as a son of Abraham, of the holy nation of Israel. And Jesus is telling him, your born, your fleshly birth, is not good for going into the kingdom of God. Even though you, are a, you think you are a son of Israel, you need to get another nature because that nature is sin. A natural birth cannot correct the evil nature of that, of that birth. So what is flesh is flesh. It cannot correct. So you need to have a spiritual birth to enter the kingdom of God. Then it seems that his mind is not really catching everything, so he will use another uh, illustration, the wind. The wind blows where it wishes. 
No one can fully understand the wind. So the new birth is a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Something new, we cannot control it. The new birth is like the wind. The wind is out of man's control. You know, we like to control everything. Religion control. We, ha we can do a lot of things. Religion tells us if you do good things, you will get, you know, uh, some good with God, good standing with God. If you do like this, you control whatever you want to do for God when you are in uh, religion. With the new birth, you don't control anything. It's grace. You don't know what, when, it, when it will uh, happen, uh, whatever will, uh, will do. It takes place according to the will of God. Listen to the testimonies of Christians. If you listen to the testimony of the Christian, they will tell you uh, how surprised they are that God made them being born again. The circumstance that it happens. Like in my family, why me? Instead of my brothers and my sister, why was I selected? Like me personally, in my family, I was the worst. I was the black sheep in my family. I was the baby in the family. So why did God chose me to bring light into my family? I was the worst. I was the youngest. It should have taken somebody else. So it's, it's like this. The wind, you don't control. You don't control the grace of God. You don't control the, the wisdom of God and the, the, the choosing of God in order to, to perform His will and to bring people to, to salvation. It's the grace of God. When someone is born of the Spirit, you cannot see it take place. It's invisible, but you can see the result. There is a change. So the Holy Spirit needs to regenerate us, and He will do it as the wind. So then in verse 9, we see that Nicodemus shows the inability of the natural mind to comprehend divine things. He was still in the dark. He could not understand the new birth, even after Jesus explained it with many natural illustrations. And uh, Jesus even tells him, listen, in verse 12, I have uh, used a lot of earthly illustration. You don't understand. How will you understand heavenly truths you cannot even understand the most basic things here. And then Jesus is going to use another type of illustration from the Old Testament. Something that the teacher in Israel, like Nicodemus, uh, you know, a very important teacher in Israel among the Pharisees, should understand and connect with. And it is the story of the serpent that was lifted. For those of you who are new believers, maybe you do not know that story, but I invite you to look at it when you can. It's in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 4 to 9. Uh, this is a story of sin. The nation of Israel rebelled against God. And because they were so much against God, God sent fiery serpents that bit the people and many, many died on that day. So the serpent of brass was a type of the Lord Jesus and the serpent is a picture of judgment. And people have been bitten by sin and it was necessary that this serpent was put there. It's a story also of grace. Not only a story of, of, of sin and judgment, but it's a story of grace. Moses interceded for the people when they were bitten by the serpent and they were under God's judgment. And God provided a, a remedy. And he told Moses to make a brass serpent and lifted it on a pole high above so that People who have been bitten by the snake and would normally die would be saved by looking at it. They couldn't do anything more. They just had to look and then the stricken person who looked at the serpent were miraculously healed. So as I said, the serpent of brass represented by Moses' story is a picture of what the Lord Jesus would eventually be doing. He would be lifted. And when people look at him and rely upon him for our sins and the judgment he took, our, our judgment, then we would be saved. You know, nothing could be done. The, the serpent, the solution to the serpent problem. Uh, we could say, okay, how can we get rid of the serpent? We can kill all the serpent. 
get everybody get your tool and go running to kill all the serpent or you can um, do a lot a, a, a lot of things uh, f try to find antidote against the poison or you could uh, pass anti anti snake laws nobody is allowed to have a pet snake in the place or, or you can climb the pole and just uh, run away from the serpent. No, you, there was no things that men could do to save them from that judgment, but the solution that God himself had given Moses. Look, that's all. And that's a picture, this story is also a picture of faith. It's a picture of grace, because Moses interceded and God gave a remedy. It's also a picture of faith. You just look. You have nothing to do. Just look at the snake and you will be saved. And th this is what happened. And whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ will receive eternal life. And then we finish with John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten song that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, this text is not about how God is cool. Because if you want to give an attribute to God that fits his character, I would, I would suggest merciful. God is merciful. Because if you see that God is cool and you present God is cool, you will be avoiding everything that has to do with judgment, the death, the punishment, the blood, the need for repentance. You will not want to present that because it can bother people and they will misjudge God and they will think that God is mean, that God is angry, that God is, you know, uh, punishing people and all this. And, and uh, no, no, you realize that the concept of punishment is vanishing from our society. There is no more concept of punishing in the youngest generation, among parents, among educators. Punishment is the, the worst kind of word and concept in the world. So everything that has to do with God punishing sin or sin bringing a negative result is certainly not going to be popular. So if you want to preach the gospel or tell the truth about Jesus Christ, it's not about being popular. You will not win by being popular. You will not bring people to, the, to, to heaven by being popular. You will win people to go to heaven by telling the truth. And the truth is that God is not cool. God is merciful. Because in the, when you talk about mercy, you really tell the old gospel. If you say God is cool, you will just talk about the blessing, the advantages, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the good life that you, you inherit that is part of the gospel, and you will not be presenting the complete truth. If you say God is merciful, then you have to tell the old story of redemption. You have to tell how God is angry with sin. Because in the text here, for God so loved the world, Yes, God loves the world, but God does not l love man's sin. He never did, and he never will. He doesn't like the wicked world system. He doesn't like the, gov the corruptions of government. He doesn't like murder. He doesn't like uh, physical violence. He doesn't like uh, divorce. He doesn't like all of these things that come from the corruptions of sin. He doesn't like this world system. But he loves the soul of the people and he provided the remedy for the salvation of this old world. So he is, he is not willing that anyone perish. But the idea of perishing is part of the gospel. But God is merciful. He does not treat us as our sin deserves. He sent a remedy and the brazen serpent, which is a symbol of Jesus Christ being uh, lifted. So if you want to describe Jesus, if you want to describe God to someone, God is merciful. You know in the Old Testament, mercy is from the word kesed. It is translated many times in the mo most modern Bible version, it's translated uh, unfailing love, abundant love, uh, abundant in love and gracious love and everything. So this is the word of the Old Testament, but the word is mercy. 
or merciful, compassionate, kind, patient. He does not treat us, but God is also just in everything. It is part of his mercy. God is merciful. In mercy, there is love. There is abundant, infinite, uh, unfailing love. God so love the world, as proven his love, that when we were still sinner, he gave his own son. And in Romans it says, if he has given his son for us, will he not give us everything on top of that? So his love is there. God so loved the world. He is not willing that anyone perish. But there is a choice here. How is a person saved? A person must receive Jesus Christ. And mercy involves conviction of sin, it involves acknowledgement of sin, it involves understanding and accepting the severity and the judgment of God. We must understand these things and accept that this, truth, this is the truth of God and it, we must accept that there is penalty for sin. It includes repentance from sin and a total reliance on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is how we get born again. We enter into another dimension that we can understand heavenly truths and that we can be fit to be saved and to go to heaven. That whoever believes it in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is mercy. God is not cool. God is merciful. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, would uh, Glenda come forward and we would want to sing the, this last song that uh, we sang uh, this morning. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me, please? <laughs> 